I'm here to tell you that we should pollute the environment more in order to ultimately pollute it less. I know, I know, it's a controversial take, but I guarantee you in 10 minutes, I'll have you convinced. I'm an ecologist, and I've been studying biodiversity conservation and freshwater science for many decades, here in North America, Europe, and Southeast Asia. Starting when I was very young, I loved playing in the ditches by my house. I caught frogs and tadpoles, I created small dams, and I watched the water flow. I thought a lot about that water, where it was going and where it was coming from, how landscapes are changed and shaped by water. Now that I'm an adult, I still think a lot about water. But I think about it more in the way that I think about my own health. If I have a stomach ache, I remember what I ate over the last few hours, but I also think about that big deadline I have coming up and how I didn't sleep well last night. Think about how all these things are connected and what changes I need to make so that my stomach ache goes away, stays away. I believe that this is how we should be approaching environmental issues. We need to understand the connections between the parts of the ecosystem so that we can really understand them better. Ecosystems are made up of complex communities of interacting organisms and their physical environment. A freshwater lake, for example, has fish, but also water and bacteria and algae, zooplankton, amphibians, reptiles, birds, as well as the rocks and sediment and climate that surrounds it. Changes in any of these factors can have a cascading impact on the ecosystem as a whole. To really understand what's going on, we need to pollute whole systems in small and careful ways so that we can understand them better. But let me take a step back. Where is pollution coming from in the first place? How are we impacting our freshwater systems? Yes, there's garbage and oil spills and leaching from tailing ponds, but I wonder how many of you realize that many of the products you use on a daily basis are also ending up in our waterways? The chemicals found in so many soaps and hand sanitizers, the pharmaceuticals we take to keep us healthy, small pieces of rubber that are wearing off of the tires of your car. All of these have materials and chemicals in them that are not treated by wastewater treatment plants and eventually end up in our freshwater systems. What impact are they having? This is where polluting the environment comes in. This is the ISD Experimental Lakes area. It is an amazing place, and I really wish I could invite you all to visit this incredible piece of northwestern Ontario because you really have to see it to believe it. But what really makes it incredible is it is a place where we conduct whole ecosystem experiments on small boreal lakes to understand the impacts that we humans are having on freshwater systems all around the world. It may sound crass, but we treat our lakes like test tubes. When you do a study in a laboratory, you have a known amount of something in your test tube. You add a known amount of something else to it, and you observe the change. This is what we do to our lakes. Because we have been studying these systems for 56 years, we know what's in these lakes. We understand their fish populations and invertebrates, their water chemistry and hydrology. We've been watching their natural variability and how they've been responding to climate change. If we want to study a specific human impact, like an oil spill or a harmful algal bloom, we design an experiment that mimics something that's happening in other parts of the world. So we add nutrients, or we simulate a controlled oil spill, and then we observe the change. We study the parts of the lake, the fish, the invertebrates, the water chemistry, and the lake as a whole, how all these factors are connected and impact each other. And from this, we're able to truly say how the pollution is impacting our freshwater systems. See how that's different from just working in a test tube? Let me tell you the story of synthetic estrogen. This is the hormone found in birth control pills. Millions of women around the world take this pharmaceutical for family planning and other health concerns. When a woman takes birth control, only a portion of it is broken down in her body. The rest is excreted in her urine and ends up in city wastewater. The vast majority of our wastewater treatment plants are not designed to treat for chemicals like synthetic estrogen. And as a result, it ends up downstream from urban centers. 
We added this chemical to one of our research lakes for three years. And for that whole period, and for the six years after the study, we studied everything in the environment that we could. And the results were incredible. Essentially, the male fathead minnows, the largest population of small fish in the lake, turned female. The liver in the males of these fish produced a protein that female ovaries used to make eggs. This drastically reduced sperm production and then limited their ability to reproduce. This much we could have understood had we studied fish in a tank in a laboratory. What we never would have been able to understand was the drastic impact that this had on the ecosystem as a whole. Because the fathead minnows couldn't reproduce, their population declined by 99%. Yep, 99%. This resulted in a decline in the lake trout population who eat fathead minnows, and at the same time an increase in the zooplankton, or the small invertebrates that were no longer being eaten. We never would have been able to understand this drastic ecosystem shift had we not studied the lake as a whole. From this research, we can clearly see that synthetic estrogen has broad and significant impacts on fish health and population dynamics in freshwater systems. But we also learned that it breaks down relatively quickly in the environment. And if the input stops, the impact does not last long. Women need this drug. We don't want to limit its use, but we should be considering synthetic estrogen a chemical of concern and figuring out how to keep it out of our waterways. I know what you're thinking. What about plastic? It's easy to see how these break down and end up in our freshwater systems, but did you know that your fleece is also made of plastic? And tiny fibers of it break down in the washing machine and end up washing away? We now know that microplastics are found all around the globe, including remote areas of the Arctic and deep in sediment deposits of the ocean. We know that they likely have an impact on the environment, but it's hard to know exactly how or what. To answer these questions, we could study microplastics with fish in a tank to see if it gets embedded in their muscle. Spoiler alert, it does. Or if this impacts their health. Spoiler alert, it can. Or we could put microplastics in a test tube in a lab, ones that have chemicals associated with them like dyes or UV protection, and see if those end up leaching in the water. It does in some cases. But none of this would tell us the impact on the environment as a whole. None of this would tell us if those microplastics in the water impact the algae or the invertebrates living in it, or if the microplastics in the fish will affect their behavior or impact the eagles or bears or people that eat them. To understand the impact of microplastics in freshwater systems, we need to take a holistic approach to science. We need to consider and experiment on the whole as opposed to the individual parts. And what really strikes me is that this line of thinking is very much the way Indigenous perspectives and ways of understanding the land in speaking with knowledge keepers and elders from Treaty 3 territory, I have learned that you cannot separate the material from its environment and context, and that every natural process is influenced by and will influence every other natural process. The Women's Council of Treaty 3 have developed a declaration on water, the Nibi Declaration, to share their relationship with water, or Nibi, this declaration states that water is alive. It has a spirit. It's the lifeblood of our mother, and it connects everything. Now, considering this perspective and all the problems in the world, how can I seriously be advocating for polluting more? But I really believe that without these kinds of carefully thought out experiments, we cannot understand these complex environmental systems and come up with logical and effective ways to protect them better. We need to pollute the environment to understand it better. And even more importantly, we need to pollute the environment to pollute it less. So, to come back to that question about microplastics and how it's impacting freshwater systems, right now there's a group of scientists from across Canada and the U.S. who are trying to answer that very question on a lake at the ISD Experimental Lakes area. They are adding microplastics to a whole lake 
every two weeks during the open water season, and they're studying everything in the environment that they can, much like we did with synthetic estrogen. But what really matters here is that we want solutions. We want to change behaviors, policies, practices. And for that, we need big picture science that can help us understand what we need to change to keep the freshwater systems upon which that we all depend safe. What do we need to change in our own lives? What does government and industry need to do? And what will be the real impact if we fail to act? And I would invite you all to go home and think about your own lives a little bit more holistically. When you have a stomach ache, don't just think about what you ate, but consider all the factors that might have affected it. And then think about how that one part of your health is affecting your life and the lives of others. This is how you make real long-term change. You consider the connections between the things, and then you change systems to make your life, the environment, and the world a better place. And that is why we should be polluting the environment more so that we can ultimately pollute it less. Did I convince you?